Great. So we're going to start. Um, so hello, everyone. Welcome to the Sustainable Development Solutions Network Youth Session in collaboration with Bridging Gaps. At SESN Youth, we are committed to empower young people to lead the way for sustainable development and providing them with the necessary skills and abilities to do so. And that's why we're very excited to have this session today. Um, before I introduce the speaker and give her the floor, please make sure that you are muted. If you're not speaking, we'll have some time for Q&A towards the end, and we'll give you the floor if you have any questions or comments throughout the session as well. And in the meantime, please, as I said, uh, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat and say which country you're joining from. And now, without further ado, I'm honored to introduce Janina Peter, who is uh, the founder and CEO of Bridging Gaps, a nonprofit that is leading, uh, that is helping facilitate community microloans and entrepreneurial training within underserved communities, primarily in Africa and Latin America. Today, Janina will be discussing the role of storytelling in fundraising and how this can be used as an impactful tool for fundraising campaigns and to create impact. So we're very looking forward to the session. And now, uh, without further ado, Janina, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Raquel and SDSN youth team. We are really, really happy uh, to be here today. And I'm super happy to get to present a bit about our work with Bridging Gaps and um, especially this exciting topic of storytelling and fundraising. Uh, before I start, I just want to say I try to make this a bit interactive. So if you are actively trying to fundraise for something, I would invite you to grab either a piece of paper or open a Word document or something so you can take a couple of notes. Or, of course, you can also write in the chat and feel free to reply in the chat to any questions during the presentation. Like Helen, the team will monitor it or feel free also to unmute if you feel like you want to um, you want to come in. So I'll start with my introduction. Um, my name is Janina, I'm from Germany, based in Spain. I'm the founder of Bridging Gaps. I'm also an innovation consultant. I work with the UN and several uh, nonprofits. I work as a sustainability expert with different companies. My master's is in development economics, my bachelor's in business. And then I also did a social innovation management program um, as a postgrad. And now I'm going to do a second introduction. So uh, I want to tell you a bit about where I'm coming from, where my family came from. So uh, my grandparents on the one side and my great grandparents on the other side were both uh, refugees from a region called Silesia, which is now Poland. And we had a lot of like really strong females in my family that, that really inspired me, that did a lot of good. Uh, one of my great grandmas, she was hiding refugees during the war. So really, really inspirational women that um, I think helped me get to where I am today. Um, I'm the first person in my family that graduated from high school and went to university and I started my career in the corporate sector, mainly to save money, to be able to afford going to university, to be able to go travel, to volunteer and get to know other cultures and one of these journeys um, led me to South Africa, where I met a woman in an Airbnb. I was staying with her and she told me she's working in townships there to bring um, water, to provide electricity. And for me, this was the first time that I realized this can be a career path. So it's not just volunteering, but you can actually work in this area. But I didn't have anyone you know, in my network before who was actually working in, in this area. So this is what led me to, um, to Bridging Gaps, finally. So now I would like to hear from you. You can just use the chat. Um, which of these introductions did you connect with more? Which one do you remember more? And why do you think that is? I'll just wait a couple of seconds. Uh, Raquel and team, let me know if there's anything in the chat. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, everybody, please feel free to use the chat or if you want to speak, uh, raise your hand and we'll give you the floor. But thank you, Janina, for that introduction. There's nothing right now. 
I'll keep going. Feel free to um we we just saw a comment okay. and <laughs> Sandisile says, growing up around strong women, I can relate to that. Uh, Sandisile Howe from the Kingdom of Eswatini, director of Echo Harmony. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Yeah, so that's kind of the point I was trying to make. The second introduction was, of course, much more personal, using personal stories. And the first one, probably you forgot already half of it, like the titles and what the, the study programs were called. That's usually how it is. But we kind of tend to go with, you know, I have a master's in this, I have this position. But if you actually use these stories, then people tend to connect much more with you. And that's when we get to fundraising. People invest in people. So one very important point that I want to make is that your own story is as important as the stories you, you want to tell about your organization and your work that you're trying to fundraise for, because it's very, very important that donors also connect with you. And this is what we're trying to do at Bridging Gets, that we really connect people to other people, uh, specifically entrepreneurs. So I have an example here of uh, Piera, who is is from Italy. Um, she is an entrepreneur. She's also an artist. And then on the other side, we have Yoska, who's a refugee in the BDB settlement in Uganda. And Piera donated two bridging gaps so that Yoska could receive a microloan and start her tailoring business. So both of these businesses are very much related and Piera really connected with Yoska's story. So this is what really helps us in our fundraising. So I would invite you to think a bit about what stories do you want to tell? Uh, think about you know, your, your past. Did you have a life-changing journey? Did you travel somewhere? Uh, maybe an inspiring family member, like I mentioned, my great grandma, for example. Uh, do you have a special achievement maybe that you work towards? I think these things, even if they're small things, they don't have to be huge, but this is what really helps people to connect with you. So feel free to take some notes if anything comes up now and Feel free also to, to put in the chat if you can already think of something or you can just unmute in the end of the session and I would love to hear a bit of the kinds of stories that you're thinking about. So now I want to share a story of Malish James. Uh, Malish James is from South Sudan. He is a refugee already for the second time in his life. He's now based in Uganda's BDBD refugee settlement. And Malish and me, we got connected through my work with the World Food Program. Um, Malish did the Storytellers Program of the World Food Program. I used to work um, at the WFP in Berlin and we kind of stayed in touch, became friends. And Malish shared one fact with me that was really, really shocking to me. And that was that sometimes the refugees in BDBD and in other communities, they sell the food aid that they receive from organizations like WFP. And then, of course, from my WFP lens, this was really something that I didn't expect because the food aid is provided to combat malnutrition. But Mali, she already has four children. And when he needs other basic commodities for his family, sometimes he sells this food aid to afford them. And it's very much understandable on the one hand, but also not the idea of the food aid. So together we brainstormed and we tried to explore other pathways of how could the refugees in BDBD um, create their own livelihoods? What could we do to provide an income? And this is how the idea of, of Bridging Gaps was born. And so I always like to use this story because it, um, first of all, I feel like it's very um, touching, it's very emotional, and anyone can can connect with it. Everyone knows that uh, we need food, but we also need other basic commodities, like for example, clothing for, for children, and nobody should have to make these choices. But sometimes as a refugee especially, or if you're in a situation like this, you don't have a choice. And so I always use this story because it connects my personal experience to Malish and of course to um, Bridging Gaps. And, it supports our, you know, our donors and understanding where we're coming from, why we started this. And if you bring a bit of emotions into your pitch, um, that usually helps to get people to, um, to invest in your cause. So again, I um, would like you to reflect a bit 
how do you think um, you can connect your own story to the cause you want to fundraise for? Maybe you are fundraising for an organization that is within your community, or maybe you're just really, really passionate about a specific topic. So this is something, again, feel free if you already have a couple of thoughts on this to put it in the chat, or you can also unmute um, later on. Uh, Raquel, in case anything comes in, feel free to just interrupt and, and throw it in here. Um, I will make sure to do that, Janina. So far, we have many answers to the first question you raised, um, but we'll make sure and towards the end, we'll also have time to discuss this. There was a comment to, to see if you can speak a little slowlier. Um, sure. I think that would be appreciated since English is not the first language for many people. Thank you. Of course, that I can do. You know, I get excited when I get to speak about bridging gaps, but I'll do that. Um, so we will also share this presentation later on and we are recording the meeting. So if you wanna come back to any of these questions and reflect a bit more, then you can do that um, later on as well. So one more thing that I wanted to share that is really important is to have your numbers and facts ready. So stories, of course, and storytelling are very, very important when we want to convince donors, but you also need to know what you're talking about. You need to have the statistics ready to make a convincing case. And um, I want to share a bit of how you can connect the two. Um, I have three different um, you know, facts that are, um, well, it's the same fact broken down in three different um, areas. So first of all, the fact I wanted to share is that globally, 1.4 billion adults lack banking services. This is a really, really big number. And usually we cannot really picture 1.4 billion people. Um, maybe we're, we're shocked to hear this number for a second, but it doesn't really connect with us. And usually the bigger the numbers are, the less we connect with them or our donors connect with them. So one thing that you can always do is to break this number down. So. The same thing basically is one in six adults does not have access to funding or financial markets. And this is something we can actually picture. We can picture a room full of, um, of six people. And then if we imagine one of them seen on a global level does not have access to financial markets, does not have a bank account, this is something we can picture and that actually speaks more to us. So I always recommend breaking down your facts in this way. And then the third step that I did here was that I connected this fact to a personal story. And um, this is a story I always like to share. So one of our refugee entrepreneurs is called Amito. She is a young mother who fled the war in South Sudan. She is also based in BDB in Uganda. And she wanted to open her own business. She had a great idea, but she did not have access to funding, like one in six adults worldwide. So this is something you can really picture. You hear the story, you connect with Amito, you can picture what's going on and you don't understand um, why, why does she not have access to banking? You wanna learn more rather than with the first fact that I shared. So with Amitu, you may ask, why does she not have access to funding? Well, as a refugee, she may not have papers. She may not have uh, collateral to apply for a traditional loan, um, anything like this. And it really gets you thinking. So um, I really recommend doing this when you, um, when you work on your pitch and you wanna fundraise for, for a cause. So with Amito's story, I want to share a bit more of how Bridging Gaps works. So we use Amito's story, not, um, not just for fundraising, but also to explain our, our whole approach. So Amito was actually 18 when, uh, when she got pregnant. Um, and she had to, to flee the war. She went to Uganda. Um, but her husband left her when her son was born. So she had to stop her education, drop out of school, everything to take care of her son. 
And again, like one in six adults worldwide, she did not have access to any traditional banking services. So Amito received a donation turned into a microloan from Asset Bridging Gaps. And um, this is her receiving the loan from Malish, whose story you have heard, uh, our co-founder. And um, with this microloan, Amito was able to open a retail shop that is going really, really well. So now she is working successfully as an entrepreneur in DDB. And just a fun fact that I always like to share, this is the same house on both pictures. And this is just one week, uh, taken one week apart. So this is a week uh, after she received the micro loan. She had her whole business set up. So you can really, really tell how impactful um, this micro loan was to her. Um, and so we have a bit of a special twist on our micro loans. So they are not traditional micro loans, but they are community based micro loans. So they are paid forward within each community, meaning we are really a nonprofit. We don't work like a bank. Um, it's a community led model um, that we that we have at Bridging Gaps. And so I want to outline a bit the, the long term impact um, that this donation and microloan had for Amito and also her community. So first of all, in Amito's case, she was able to go back to school because her business is running so well. She could afford someone to support her taking care of her son. So now she could go back to school and pick her education up once again. So this is really, really huge. Also, Amito's children can go to school because they don't have to support the family financially, since Amito is now a, uh, an entrepreneur that is doing very well. Um, Amito started a social business and she is donating parts of her products to members in the community who cannot afford them at all. So really, really to the most uh, vulnerable in the community. And then, as I mentioned, because of our pay it forward model, the money she is saving goes to the next entrepreneur in the community. So once Amito has saved the amount she received from Bridging Gaps, the next person can also open a business. So it's really a positive ripple effect of sustainable businesses um, that are started in each community. And then last but not least, because Amito is really inspiring, uh, she is also a mentor for other women uh, in the EBD. So she's trying to inspire other female leaders as well. So this is really uh, how you can show that, you know, one donation has a huge impact and you can illustrate this using, using a story. And we have so many entrepreneurs like Amitu. We started Bridging Gaps about two years ago and we already have over 200 entrepreneurs that we trained in different countries. So imagine the impact of this when all of them pay the money forward, all of them become mentors to others. Um, this is really, really uh, something, something big and a lot of stories also that we have to share. Um, so now I want to stay with kind of the facts and the money and how to break everything down. Um, but I want to talk about the donation, the specific donation. So what if I told you that you can support a refugee like Amito to start their own business with as little as one euro? So this is something that very much depends on your target group. So of course, if you talk to big foundations or the UN or uh, even companies, you usually ask for bigger amounts. This is more for individual fundraising because not everyone may be able to donate a lot of money, but probably most of us could give one euro. Um, so this is what we did, and this is how we broke down our numbers in order to convince more people to support bridging gaps. Um, so usually a microloan in Uganda is about 400 euros, the microloans that we provide. Um, it's a bit different in other countries that we work in, so it really depends on the community, and we always set the, the kind of target of each microloan together with the community. Um, and then that is accompanied by training and mentorship, where we usually spend around 100 euro. Uh, so we broke all of this down. And 
one euro provides one hour of training for one refugee entrepreneur. So this is something, you know, again, that you can easily picture and um, that you can possibly afford. Um, then one euro helps sustain a refugee owned business through a micro loan for one day. And one euro provides 2.4 minutes of local peer to peer mentorship. So I always recommend also breaking breaking down the donations to the specific impact that that each donation will have. And then, of course, if, if you try to fundraise from foundations, uh, you will have to do a budget anyways with all of these. But this really helps if you want to talk to um, an individual kind of target group, individual donors. So again, uh, if you are currently trying to fundraise for a specific cause, I would invite you to think about which numbers do you need to bring across, both kind of the facts you want to share, like maybe it's your goal to, to combat poverty. So think about how many people are impacted by poverty. How can you break that down? Is that one and how many? Do you have a specific story that you can connect this to? Um, and then also think about the donations you are asking for and how can you break down this number? So uh, if you're asking for 100 euros or dollars or um, another number, what will this do? Like, what is the impact this will have? And can you also connect this to a story? And again, we'll share this later so you don't have to uh, have to think about all of this now. I, I would actually recommend to take a bit of time um, to really come up with some good stories and feel free to reach out also after this. I'm happy to to look at anything and provide feedback as well. Hello, hello. Hi. Hello, hi. <laughs> I'm a Tuzen land in Emia. I am uh, from Madagascar and uh, I wanted to share my story uh, because first of all, I am at work and uh, a little bit of time, maybe I have 30 minutes, 20 minutes here. So I would like to share mine in advance if, if possible. I'll, I'll leave it to Raquel for the timekeeping if that's okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think, uh, Janina, if that's okay with you, we can take a short in intervention and then leave the rest towards the end. For oh, sure, definitely. Yeah. And feel free okay. to share my email address and, and LinkedIn in the in the chat so you can reach out also after. But go ahead, uh, Lundi. Yeah, so uh, as I said earlier, I am Lundi. Uh, I've been working on uh, leadership uh, for about when I was young because... I was passionate about uh, scouting, uh, going hiking and learning about how to leading, especially that's where my leadership thing grow with me. And uh, back then I have big family, growing a big family, we are nine. And that's a bit difficult for my parents to send us to school. And also we live in area where I can say remote countryside in Madagascar. And 80% of the 80% of people in my community is farmers. And lack of educational is the, uh, the big problem because as a farmer, they would rather send their children to work in a rice field in order to send them to school because a family uh, business is more important. Parents do not see the uh, benefit impact, direct impact of education. So I was lucky that my parents uh, understand that education is power. So they do their best to send me to university. And some of my friends uh, did not even attend secondary school. So that is uh, where I, when I come at university, I didn't even get my bachelor's degree now, but I um, wanted, I hope to continue. And uh, I wanted to become a teacher and an entrepreneur. So at right now, I already established LENS, uh, a youth development center, where it equipped uh, children, adults with uh, a, uh, youth language barriers, and uh, also <clears throat> help vulnerable children in my community. It's a uh, Youth Development Center just one year from now because I have worked for this fundraising 
I applied too many uh, applications, but did not success because with this uh, fundraising, especially when it comes to uh, organization, if you don't, uh, de if you did not do something already, it's difficult for you to get funds because uh, they need something concrete, something already done. So I, I just continue my education. I did some online training during pandemic. And then I also uh, able to work at Royal Caribbean International. And I worked there for one contract. I have been able to save some enough money and that's why uh, I have the money to start the organization. So for me, education is power to uh, break down to, uh, oh, to alleviate the poverty in my community. So that is the story I'm, I'm sharing here. And thanks to now, as a Bridging Gaps ambassador, maybe I can do more with my community. So I uh, thank you very much. That, that is my uh, story. Thanks so much, Landy. Super nice to hear from you. And that's a really, really inspiring story, actually. So I feel like you just need to get this also in front of the right people. And then probably you'll be able to fundraise much more. So I would be happy to um, to work on this more together. So feel free to reach out and we can um, we can talk more about it. But you made a very important point, actually, that it's hard to start something without any money, but then if you haven't done something, it's hard to get the money to start. So I feel like starting, that's the most difficult thing. And in my case, I was lucky that um, I kind of had a big community when I started. We did a big, you know, GoFundMe campaign, but most of the people that donated, I noticed were people I knew or people that I had at least a secondary connection to, like my mom's colleagues from work and, and so on, you know, and that's usually how it starts. Um, but I'm really, really impressed that you said, you know, you'll go work a job, you save money, and then you start your um, your work. So really well done. And I hope we can uh, we can connect more. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> okay. Did we have anyone else? Otherwise, I'll continue with the slides. I think you can continue and we can, uh, towards the end, open the floor. Sounds good. Okay, so one thing that I wanted to share is the importance of pictures when we share our stories. So all of these pictures um, are Bridging Gaps microloan recipients and participants. Um, it's very important that you have your own pictures um, or you know, work with the partner organization and that they really tell the story and support your story. So I just um, left a couple of, of important points here on this slide. So one thing is that you wanna try to choose pictures that bring about the right emotions that you wanna convey with your pitch and to your specific target group. And one thing that I found interesting um, is that usually kind of positive, positive stories, positive pictures, they tend to work better with younger audiences like millennials, Gen Z. Um, but then when you have a bit of an older audience, uh, usually they are, we still have, you know, campaigns like, I don't know, like kind of guilt campaigns, you know, where you see children that are suffering from hunger, these types of images, and they tend to work, they still work better with this um slightly older older target groups. So this is something that I found really interesting. Um, at Bridging Gaps, we decided to really go for the first target group, not to exclude any donors, but just because we don't want to show anyone as um, needy or, um, you know, we, we work with entrepreneurs who are actually extremely powerful. They may have been, you know, led to, um, to a bad situation that they had to flee a war or something, but this could happen to anyone. So we really want to show empowerment instead of guilt. But of course, this does not work with, with every donor. So you always have to keep this in mind a bit when you choose your pictures and you choose your stories. Um, one important point is always ask for consent, especially if you have 
kids in the pictures, anything else. But anyways, once there are people in the pictures, you need everyone's consent. I recommend also gathering written consent because, um, for example, we are funded by UNHCR. Whenever we need to do reporting, they always ask for it. But not just for this, obviously, you should always ask people before even taking um, their pictures and their stories. Um, this next point is really, really um, important as well, and I think it connects well to the point that that you made, Longi, with your story um, to to not use stock photos. Um, and this connects with what you said about not um, not having been able to do something, but having to fundraise. But then, you know, if you use stock photos, usually that's pretty easy to recognize and to trace. If you apply, you know, for a foundation, for a fund, um, it's easy to see when there are stock photos and then they tend to think there's nothing there yet. Um, and so then, you know, they usually don't fund you. So I feel like this is a really important point that, I was not aware of in the beginning. So in the beginning, we did use stock photos to have something, you know, to get started somehow. But I learned that this is not something you should do at all. So better to try to take a, a few photos yourself, um, have maybe, I don't know, a free workshop or something. So you have something to show. Um, then two more points, um, just less is more. Um, try not to overwhelm your audience with lots of stories, but rather try to focus on a few and always bring them back. So today I decided to talk about Amito and, and Malish, and I use these stories a lot because you have to think about you know, your audience, um, you may know these stories well, and I tell them all the time, but if you talk to someone maybe once a month or they see a post um, every now and then, it's very hard if it's always a lot of different people. So it's better to stay with a couple of really good, impactful stories um, instead of you know, focusing on um, on quantity. And the same goes for pictures, because once you have recognition, people are more likely to actually donate. Um, and then, of course, you need to ensure that you have high quality material. And again, this, um, this depends a bit on the donor, but we work, for example, with um, companies as well, so CSR divisions, um, as well as, you know, foundations, and they usually also want to share your work as the work they fund. So it's it's very important that you have good quality um, photos, well-written stories, and um, everything, you know, to kind of deliver something for, for the money they provide. Thank you, Janina. There was one comment in the chat from Makava that uh, they say, I have also realized that when they said that a picture can say a thousand words, they really summarize it aptly. You can write highly persuasive articles about the plight of a certain group of people or talk about it, but nothing beats capturing and presenting the information in a picture or video format. It also makes it easy for people to visualize or make connections between their financial donations and the subsequent uh, particular situation positive impact. So that was very, very helpful for our audience. And I'll let you continue now. Thank you so much for the comment. And it's it's so true, actually. And especially, you know, today we are on like all the different social media channels. And usually we are so overwhelmed by everything that is posted, everything that is shared. There are so many events and, you know, you see a million pictures while scrolling Instagram or LinkedIn or whichever platform. And when you have a captivating picture, then you may actually read what is, uh, what is written and what it's about, or maybe even better if, the picture is already describing what you want your audience to know. So yes, very, very important point. Thank you for that. Um, one more important point I wanted to mention are your achievements or your organization's achievements. Um, that is really, really important to just be proud of what you have achieved, even if it's not a huge amount, but in our case, you know, I always say we've done this for two years and we have already achieved a lot. So it's always good to share this because this can also inspire others to um, support you more. So we have a lot of global and local partners already. As I mentioned before, we have trained over 200 entrepreneurs. We have 53 businesses already established and counting. Um, 
actually we now have many more team members and ambassadors so um, these numbers I think they show that there's a lot of interest but then as I mentioned we always try to kind of pair the numbers with um, stories and pictures so below you can see um, on the left this is um, an accelerator program that we joined. We have done a number of them. Basically, any accelerator program we got into, we, we took it and we did it because you can always learn something. Um, you can always get you know connected to a bigger network, to new people. And this is something that is actually also very important in fundraising is your network because you never know who can connect you to maybe someone else um, and just to have this kind of support if you have a big network and everyone gives one euro then you can already do something and maybe get started and be eligible for a bigger grant or something along those lines um one highlight for us was meeting uh professor yunos we've met with him a few times uh, for those who don't know him he's a uh, nobel peace laureate and he is what they call the father of microloans so he is the founder of grameen bank in bangladesh um, and actually now he is um, he is leading the newly established interim government in Bangladesh. So you may have just heard about him in the news as well. Um, we took part in a boot camp with um, WFP in Uganda. And last but not least, we were selected by, by UNHCR to receive the Refugee-Led Innovation Fund to support our work in DDBD in Uganda. This is one of our biggest achievements so far that we are really, really proud of. Um, so I'm just always very happy to, to share this. And then one more thing that I find important, and again, it depends a bit on the target group that you're talking to, is to show your impact and your work in different ways. So you can, you can share numbers, you can share photos, you can share stories. We also use a lot of, you know, design, like, for example, now these world maps show which countries or which regions we are active in. And it depends a bit on how your donors are thinking or who you work with. Um, let's say I wanted to fundraise from maybe a travel agency. I would probably highlight this slide if I wanted to fund from, I don't know, an agricultural company. I would probably highlight this um, this picture and our work in um, in agriculture and and food security. So um, it really depends, and you need to think a lot about um, your donor before doing a pitch and really targeting your stories, your images, your design, your presentation. Um, so for us, just to show you a bit also what's on the slide. So we've been working from the start in Uganda um, and Brazil as well. We started in a, in a favela in Rio de Janeiro. Now we are also working with um, a refugee community in Roraima in the north um, with indigenous refugees from Venezuela. And then we have a lot of new countries that we started to work in. So some of the pictures you saw today were from the DRC, which is one of our newest projects. And then we have a few other countries, Ghana, Ethiopia, Zambia, and are actually starting in a few more. So it's um, a really, really exciting uh, process. And of course, now with our ambassador program, I know some of them are here today. Um, we are going to work in, um, in some of your countries as well. So one more, I think this is my second to last slide. So just wanted to share about this program. Um, and just to say in fundraising, try to be creative, try not to do what everyone else is doing, but come up with new ways of thinking, new ways of engaging your network, new, new stories to tell. Um, and so one program that we uh, developed that we're doing for the first time this year is a fundraising fellowship. Um, so we have selected in total 27 fundraising fellows from all around the world, and they will work with us for three months. Uh, first, to go through different workshops, have capacity building. One of our partners for this will also be SDSN, so there will be another training on um, 
uh, to, that we will do together. So looking forward to this one. Um, the second month of this fellowship will be around campaign building. So all the participants will actually develop a fundraising campaign on behalf of bridging gaps. And we um, we talked to all of them beforehand and some of them have really, really great ideas from, you know, like fundraising marathons or sports events to uh, really amazing online campaigns or, you know, physical campaigns at airports or other places. So this really helps, I think, to engage people from all over the world to reach different audiences, but also to get new and creative ideas um, and reach other, other donors, of course. And then the perk will be um, that all the fellows, of course, will get certificates, but they will also get to keep 10% of the funds they raised so they can invest them in their own organization or in another cost that is important to them. Um, so if you want to get involved in, in this, we will run it again next year. So um, just follow along. You can... Um, you can follow us on social media um, or connect with us. Um, also, we have a newsletter. So we will share once a new um, application period starts. And then, of course, you can join us as an ambassador, as a team member, or as a partner. Feel free to reach out. I would be happy to, to hear from you. Um, I'll stop here. I have a lot more to share. I could probably talk about this the, the whole day. So if anyone has any questions or if you want to, you know, reach out, feel free to do that. So Raquel and SDSN team, thank you so much. Um, it was really nice to, to be here today. Thank you so much, Janina, for that insightful presentation. We do have some questions. I will first address Benjamin's question. So he asked, uh, he wanted the presentation. And so we're recording this meeting and we will also have a blog on the existing youth website. So we'll probably be soon on that. And also Gary had a question. Um, and he wanted to know, like, in addition to sharing numbers of an ongoing basis via social or other channels, have you also seen success shining an ongoing annual report or maybe quarterly report? Has that method work? So uh, thank you, Gary, for the question. We have been asked for the report. We have not developed one yet. We are in the process, though. Uh, we haven't done it for the first years just because we still had quite a small team. Um, everyone was volunteering, so we didn't have a huge amount of resources because we used the donations really to develop um, the projects in the countries, uh, meaning, you know, with the volunteer team, everything usually takes a little bit longer. Um, so now we are finally working on our first impact report, but yes, from my experience in other organizations, this can work really well, especially if you want to fundraise from, let's say, foundations, UN organizations, or also, also companies. Thank you so much for that response. And there was another question that if you have thought about uh, implementing a project in Ghana or northern regions of Ghana, I understand that uh, you choose the countries depending on how is the interest, but if you could develop a little bit more on that, on like how do you ambition the geographical expansion, that would be great as well. Yes, so um, we already have a partner in Ghana. So we started with um, a first training there. That said, our long-term global vision is to be available in any country in the global south. Uh, we usually work with communities that live below five US dollars per day. So those really living in, in poverty, those are the people we wanna reach. We work with refugees, host communities, but also other kinds of communities. So as I mentioned in Brazil, we worked in a, um, in a favela, for example. Um, we really depend on our local partnerships as well, because of course uh, we don't have team members in every country. So with Bridging Gaps, then usually we focus on the fundraising side um, and work together with the partners to reach these communities. And usually the role of the partner organization is to host the training and to select the, um, the entrepreneurs in the community. And then once we, once we did a first workshop and they have their business ideas, we get them up on our website, we share them on social media and we do the fundraising so we can provide them with the microloans to start the businesses. So we are really 
have a network of, of partners and dependent on, on these partnerships. So really anyone that wants to implement bridging gaps, I'm more than happy to have a, a conversation. Yeah, thank you for that. I believe that it's very important uh, to geographically span as soon as it is permitted. And I mean, it's very interesting to see which countries have or which local partners are have an interest. Um, I personally wanted to ask that you talk a lot about how to adapt your communications to the fundraising pitch. And I really like what you said about the photos and like choosing your story. So I wanted to know uh, for any young leaders that are here today that they might have more than one story to choose from. How do you prioritize one story over the other? How do you decide what is the best one to move forward? Honestly, for me, this is very tricky because I get so excited about all the stories. And if it was up to me, I would share all of them today. Um, so there are a couple of things that you can do. So one, one thing is that we connect different stories with different donors, like I mentioned. So say we have a company working, I don't know, on an energy, we connect them with an entrepreneur that works uh, with solar power, for example. So we share that that story. So we always try to match it a bit to the donors. Um, in addition, if you want to talk about, say, social media, newsletters, this type um, of work, we usually try to connect with international days um, as well, because you can leverage a bit the, the monument uh, momentum from, from these days. So for example, we had a project in Brazil around period poverty. So we had women who um, who worked on creating like sanitary products and, and these types of things. Um, so there was an international day. So we did a campaign around this. Then there's World Refugee Day. We work a lot with refugees. So then we share those stories more around Refugee Day. Um, and then in general, um, I think you can try and share kind of one story at a time. So let's say we are fundraising for one entrepreneur working on a specific topic. We could focus our social media for like three weeks, four weeks on this person, on this topic, make it really coherent, try to get that money together. And then we could move on to the next story. So um, yeah, that's usually how we how we try to do it. That said, I think sometimes we we still overdo it with a lot of stories just because the whole team gets very excited. Um, but this was one one of our learnings, definitely. Amazing. Thank you so much. And we are receiving very positive feedback on the chat as well about the presentation. And as a reminder, it will be available soon on the SSNG website. And we previously shared Janina's email and LinkedIn in case you want to reach out to her. Um, Rita also has a question and she wanted to know if you know somebody who could provide mentor to her. But I think that maybe we can open the question to how do you find um, or people who can help you expand that network you were talking about? Um, I think I may know some people. So first of all, feel free to reach out like with the particular questions that you um or the particular areas you would need mentorship in. And then I'm sure we could find someone. Um, and then how to build the network. I think today is an amazing example because you know we connected with SDSN and now we're doing this session together. We're going to do another session together for the fundraising fellowship. So I think um, you know being in these kinds of events, I would be more than happy to connect with all of you, sharing a bit on on social media I and mean, especially LinkedIn is great for connecting, but not just you know, just hit connect with anyone, but rather try and connect with people who work on something that you're interested in or something that um, you feel like you have a shared connection and really target, you know, the um, the invites. Like you can always personalize it. You have a few uh, sentences that you can write, not much, but I really recommend doing that. Like I usually accept everyone who writes a personal note or just says, you know, I saw you in this event or I would like to connect about bridging gaps. And then, you know, that's it. You don't need much more, but make it personal. That really, really helps. Um, and then I think in general, in-person events also work really well, that you can, you know, talk to people, uh, connect more. 
um, share your work. Um, this is something that I, I think not everyone likes to do it, but share, you know, on your own personal channels, share about your work, um, speak at events. Sometimes, you know, it can be a bit exciting or, you know, you have to prepare a bit, but it's really, really worth it, especially if you have an organization you want to promote. So, yeah, I think these are the things I've done to, um, to build my network. And of course, I've done a lot of consulting, like I mentioned, with different organizations, different companies that also help to get different people from, from different sides and especially to connect over, over work, over a shared um, project. So when people know you from work, they know how you work, that also helps um, to get them to support your, your future work, even if it's not connected to what they're currently doing. Amazing. Thank you so much for that great advice. Um, Mohanish, you can go ahead. The floor is yours. Uh, hi, Diana. Uh, thanks for a very insightful uh, you know, presentation and all the thoughts. Uh, I have a very India-specific doubt. So, you know, I have just started fundraising about my project, which is about, you know, preserving and documenting the indigenous knowledge. Uh, the thing is with India, you know, now the foreign contribution, like the, any donation that comes from abroad, outside of India, has been regulated by an act. So we as a new charity organization, you know, there's a lot of bureaucracy thing have come. You know, we are not able to raise fund in that sector. So we're limited by the, uh, you know, government uh, restriction and all. So possibly if I have to raise fund, it would be only from the, from my own country. So I just want to know from you that what kind of approach I should have uh, so that, you know, I get more domestic uh, kind of fundraising get going to fund my project till it reaches a level where, you know, I can ask the government to allow me for foreign fund contribution as well. Thanks for, for the question and congratulations on the important work that you're doing as well. Um, I've been trying to, to read more and to get more engaged in also peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, localization of fundraising. It's definitely not yet my area of expertise. Um, but I think one thing you can try is reaching out to, to local companies or like national companies um, that could usually be, be a good start. Um, but also just, you know, doing fundraising events, like local fundraising events, engaging your community, um, engaging your target group as well, like in, engaging the indigenous community that you that you work with, even if they don't have a lot of money, maybe they could contribute in kind donations. Maybe they they make certain products that you could sell or that you could auction. Like an event like this, I imagine could be um could be good. And then probably I would also try to connect still with you know UN organizations. I'm I'm guessing they have a way to work in um in India or you know building this kind of um, network and getting people maybe from bigger uh, Indian nonprofits that that have experience in the sector that could um that could support you there um i don't know if there's any loopholes on um, you know getting funds from abroad but probably i would i would start with like nice local campaigns even if they bring in less money but then you could communicate about them and probably get bigger donors after showing what what you've done locally i don't know if that helped um but feel free to reach out also i'm happy to to chat and brainstorm always yeah, I, I did send you a request on LinkedIn and it, it does help. Thanks for your answer. The thing is like I the CSR, like the corporate social responsibility by the local companies, it does become a lucrative option. So my next question was on the same thing, like how to, uh, you know, design the campaign, which, you know, is very, you know, pertinent to the industries which have CSR uh, fund to uh, a lot. So how my fundraising campaign should be tailored according to some companies, local companies. Because this is our indigenous knowledge and the companies, you know, they might want to do their CSR for say education or for environment or like they have very specific target for CSR. So how to bring that, uh, that SDG 11 is also very important in that regard. So one thing that we, that we do that I mentioned is that we always um, pitch different projects. Of course, we have kind of a, a bigger uh, selection um of different topics um to specific companies that that match well 
Um, one thing that we're currently working on that I think could maybe be interesting for you is that we are starting a pioneers group. So I'm from Germany originally, and this is also where I registered Bridging Gaps originally. So we are trying to fundraise mostly from German companies for the moment. So we are inviting leaders in CSR, sustainability marketing from big companies to join our pioneers group, not to donate immediately, but rather um, to provide us the opportunity to learn from them. So we invite them to, um, to a workshop with us. We share a bit about what we do at Bridging Gaps, and then we ask them what would we need to change? What would we need to do in order for you to be interested to donate as a company to include this in your, your CSR work? Um, this is still in progress, so I cannot really share you know, a lot of feedback uh, or the outcomes in a, in a couple of uh, weeks or months probably. So um, if you're interested in like building something like this, I think it can help. So basically doing market research before developing the campaigns, I think it can be helpful. Of course, you have to get in touch with the companies, but honestly, usually if you ask for like a one-time workshop um, and you have a good cause, then people will uh, will likely make time. That's a great advice. Thank you, Janine. <laughs> Thank you, Manish. Thank you so much, uh, Janina and Mohanis, for uh, the questions. We have time for one or two last questions, if anybody has anything. Uh, please feel free to raise your hand or use the chat box. And if there's no more question, then we'll finalize the meeting. I'll give one minute. Oh, we do have a question. Then, uh, Makava, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, you know, I was just listening to what Janine was mentioning now. And uh, I really must say it is quite insightful. You know, things that she has mentioned are things that are very relevant, especially in our world today. I mean, things have changed. I, in, uh, you know, I work in Cape Town. You know, obviously we're working with, uh, you know, mainly migrants and asylum seekers from much of Africa. And I really must say things have changed dramatically over the past, say, 10 years. You know, back then, you know, you used to have this standard project proposal with a fixed format that you used to, uh, you know, to obviously go after donors, but things have changed dramatically. So I think there is need for creativity as far as, you know, going fundraising is concerned. We really need to try to implement this. You know, the storytelling and fundraising is very important. We need to be genuine. We need to put emotion and we also need to be relevant and to be honest. So uh, I really feel that uh, what she has said is something that if we incorporate it into our campaigns, it can actually effectively help us, you know, going forward. And I'm really grateful that I'm part of this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was really nice, Makaba. Thank you. Thank you. And we have actually one more question in the chat box. And I think we can finalize with this question because I think it's pretty useful. And it's uh, fundraising and proposal writing can sometimes be technical. Are there read short courses you can point out to help beginners interested in this field? Thank you for the question. Um, yes, there's a lot of, of reading online. Um, I did a lot of programs where where I had like fundraising for beginners. Um, I usually like personally a, a workshop uh, kind of session where you can also ask questions and engage. Um, besides this, of course, there are a lot of um, online courses that you can just kind of take on your own time. I think, for example, Acumen Academy has a couple of really nice ones on different topics. Um, also on storytelling, for example, um, to promote a bit bridging gaps again, we are going to open up some of the, the fundraising sessions that are part of the fellowship. So some of these will be open for the public to join as well. Um, so yeah, you're very welcome there. Um, and I would say maybe if we want to write a follow-up email, uh, Raquel and team, I can get together some links and then we can we can share this. Or again, feel free to reach out on, on LinkedIn and then I can um I can send those over as well. 
Yeah, I think that would be great. And actually, somebody just asked it. But yeah, thank you so much, Janina, for answering all the questions and all the comments. And of course, thank you for the very enlightening and very inspiring presentation. I think that the insights that you share uh, really show the power of storytelling and communications and how we can uh, connect with others and to a deeper level and drive really meaningful change. So thank you so, so much for that. And as we come to close today's session, I just want to take a moment also to thank each one of you for joining us and for your active participation. It's been wonderful to see many of you from different places of the world. And we will continue to push forward to in our share mission for sustainable development and for fundraising for this important cause. So thank you so much. And make sure to stay tuned for more sessions organized by SES and Youth. And of course, all the updates that Janina shared for Bridging Gaps. And we look forward to seeing you in future sessions. Thank you, everybody, and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, so, you much. so much for the wonderful presentation. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone.